Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Southwest Connections, our campus-based show that introduced you to many of the great people that make Southwest the wonderful place that it is. I'm Bill Molso, and I'm the host of our show. Uh, our guest for today's show is Dr. Jeff Bell, the Interim Dean of the College of Arts, Letters, and Sciences. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks. First time here on the show. Glad to have you. Yeah. So first, first question is a tough one. Tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you here to SMSU. So if we go way back, I grew up in Texas, so Minnesota is a strange land, but um, I did my doctoral work at Purdue in exercise physiology, but more so I looked at uh, artery health and function in individuals that had spinal cord injuries, and I did a lot of my, my research and testing on uh, wheelchair basketball players, and a job opened up with one of the universities that had a wheelchair basketball team, and I... I, even though I hadn't finished my dissertation, I knew it would be a chance of a lifetime, and I was right. It was a chance of a lifetime. So that's what brought me here to SMSU. And you've been here now for how long? I'm starting my 12th year. 12th year. So you're relatively new to the position of the Interim Dean of Arts, Letters, and Sciences, or ALS as it's more commonly referred to on campus. You made the jump from a professor now to uh, the dark side, if some would say, on the administrative side. What, what piqued your interest in moving over to the administrative side in higher ed? So um, people on campus will probably remember that I started helping out with assessment first, and, and then we had an accreditation visit with our regional accreditor of the Higher Learning Commission. And that all went really well, so I kind of got involved then with our strategic planning work. Uh, the more that I was in that uh, assessment and accreditation position, the more I realized that that was like uh, like a trial period for being a dean. And so it was in the back of my head that, you know, maybe some someday down the road I might consider moving into administration. And then um, all of a sudden, um, Dean Schaus, Amy Schaus, got, uh, got a position at another institution as associate provost. So I put my name in the in the mix, and I, I got lucky enough to get the position, and I'm really enjoying it so far. So for those that aren't in the education realm, tell us a little bit about what the assessment coordinator did and what role you played in, in uh, serving our faculty primarily in that role. So uh, as assessment coordinator, so assessment can be anything from grading a test to uh, much more elaborate portfolio um, demonstrations of, of students' learning. So really, as assessment coordinator, my job was to help programs uh, get systems in place so that they could assure um, to students that were in their majors or, or people outside of that, that they were actually learning the, the things that, that were in their curriculum. So um, I, as a coordinator of that, my job was to help them set that up, make sure that the rotations worked, and, and just encourage them, uh, providing them with information and, and things along uh, those lines. Um, that's linked to accreditation because um, almost at one point, almost 50% of institutions, including SMSU, um, got a little uh, black mark on their record from the Higher Learning Commission about their assessment processes. And so we knew that when I, when I uh, came into that role that we had a, a lot of work to do with assessment. And, and we've made a shift on our campus, and it's just it's part of our culture now that um, we do that work to make sure that not only is everything going great in the classroom, but along the four years of getting a major, that they're also um, uh, that they're also successful throughout. So. And I think our last accreditation visit um, by the Higher Learning Commission really was a testament to the work that we've done. Uh, they said, "Yeah, we, we're we're impressed with what you've done, the strides you made." And uh, I think a lot of that is credit to the work that you and the other faculty have done on that assessment front. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people put a lot of hard work into that. And we, yeah, we got a clean bill of health, so to speak, at, at our last uh, HLC visit. Um, we got another one coming up in two years. We got to get, get ready for it. Two years already. Hard to believe. Yeah. So as an exercise physiologist, obviously you, you analyze a lot of data. How is that carried over now into your role as a dean? How do you utilize data and how does that play into your daily life? Yeah, you're not the first person that's asked me that. And uh, I kind of liken it to 
there's a lot of different data than what I'm used to seeing, but it's it's on a daily basis, and and I don't have nearly as much time to mull it over. Like it's it's data on a on a quick turnaround. So I might have to look at uh, spreadsheets that that I've never seen set up, or system reports from Minnesota State, and uh, or the work that Alan Matzner um, in institutional research provides. And I gotta, I gotta distill that down and get it out as quick as possible. So um, there's a lot of similarities, but man, it's fast. It comes at you pretty furious. And I think give some examples for somebody that maybe is not familiar again with our higher ed environment. You know, obviously I'm in that role with you, so I, I've got some familiarity. But for somebody on the outside, what kind of data uh, as a dean do you have to look at uh, and then make decisions on that serve? not only the students, but the faculty and the departments? Um, yeah, so I guess one of the things that, that I've been dealing with recently is we have a first-year seminar course. All first-year students, unless they're transferring in with a large number of credits, have to take this course. Um, we usually have them take that in the fall semester, but we realized um, we were probably going to have a large influx of international students this spring. Um, we are also um, doing really well with our online uh, majors now. And so that fall start isn't, it's not the same. And so just recently we had to look at how many students might be coming in in the spring semester that will need that class, how many didn't get it in the fall. And, and uh, then I had to identify someone that could teach the class, get that approved through, through the liberal education committee for them to teach it. Um, and just, just now this morning, you know, a couple weeks ago, we started wrestling with it. Just now this morning, we offered up a section of that course for the spring that's fully online. So when you have to find a new section to offer, and maybe you don't have a faculty member, how, what role does the dean get to play in that process? Yeah, that's tricky because, you know, you, you want to make sure that there's enough students that take that class so that um, we're not paying out more money than, than what it costs. But more importantly, you want to make sure that the students that need that class will get in there so that they don't get behind in their, their academics. So it, it's, a, it's a balance between the practical and, and the more global piece of we're here for the students. We're here to make sure that the students are successful, that they get their degrees and they get them on time. And that's a real balancing act because this, the citizens that live in Minnesota expect us to be good stewards of their money. So we want to make good fiscal decisions, but also decisions that are right for our students. And in today's environment, students don't have to go anywhere to explore some other options with all of the online and, and different types of things that are out there. It's uh, competitive, so you want to be able to meet your meet the demands right. of your the clientele that you do have. Right, and I'm not a children's literature expert, but I remember reading a book about a money tree and how those aren't real. They're not real. No. They're not real. So the College of Arts, Letters, and Science, that's a, that's a mouthful, uh, serves a lot of different programs. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the majors and the disciplines that you have within that college, and then touch briefly on uh, a new one that's pretty exciting. You just got some news about one of those programs. So yeah, let's start with arts. We've got um, fine arts, um, both visual art and performing art, uh, including music and theater, um, letters, uh, that's our English, philosophy, social science kind of areas, um, including psychology, sociology, um, uh, literature, creative writing. Um, so um, there's that. And then the humanities, which is, is, is typically considered a, a liberal arts or a, um, maybe even a better definition would be a liberated arts because those studies are supposed to liberate you it's not, not anything political in nature. Um, and then um, the sciences. So you've got uh, our, your typical biology, chemistry, physics, um, environmental science, as well as exercise science in, in that realm. I think you get agriculture as well to get that in there. Is that in the science? So the ag is, is in side? business education and professional studies. But so the one area that I didn't mention is math is also yeah. part of my area. Computer science is part of my area. 
Um, and so math and computer science have worked together on a couple new initiatives. One of those is uh, an undergraduate degree in data science. So those of you that are data analytics kind of people will understand that. But also we have, we had a brand new course offered this fall in cybersecurity and the Higher Learning Commission just last week got us our approval on a master's degree in cybersecurity. So we're really excited about being able to fully roll that out. Pretty excited. I know we've had to kind of mark it with an asterisk right now. And so it'll be fun to remove that asterisk and um, talk wholeheartedly about the opportunities in math with the Master's of Science in Cybersecurity. Yeah, for the sports people out there, there's no Barry Bonds home record, <laughs> home run record on that one, right? <laughs> we took it away. Uh, another area that you oversee is the library. And the library is a pretty fascinating organization. Uh, it serves a lot of people, not just on our campus with our faculty and our students, but it's a regional resource. Tell us a little bit about what you've uh, learned about library operations and maybe a greater appreciation for what they do as a dean. I will say I am so grateful at, at how amazing our library faculty are. But a couple of a couple of interesting things that I, you know, I knew that they did, but I didn't know exactly what it was their role as a librarian was in it. Um, you know, we've got an archiving um, component to our library and. And um, our library faculty are now working with a $10,000 um, National Endowment for the Humanities grant on archiving some, some regional documents and whatnot. Um, but we also have the Center for Online Learning and Teaching, uh, and we have uh, a librarian that has kind of some expertise in bringing those resources together. And so, if you think of the old library as is the Carnegie Library, it's just a bunch of books, right? And, and then you use the Dewey Decimal System to know which floor and row to go to. But the new library is about um, greater access to online resources. And, and we've, we've kind of merged that with the, the need that faculty have to have some resources to provide better online courses. Um, so, so there's that part of our library that... Um, that our librarians have done great with. And, and Kate Borowski, who's been in charge of the Center for Online Learning and Teaching, is, has done a great job of establishing that as a resource on campus. There's probably several other things that the librarians have done that uh, recently, you know, if you, if you haven't been in the library recently, you'll notice that they, they completely redid the first floor and it's it's a welcoming place and students are using it the the study rooms in the library are packed all the time so it is that resource where where people are going to get information and and to use that information and start working with that so uh, as far as a successful library we have one what a great one and I think one of the nice things that we did a couple of years ago is that we recognize that technology is a big part of library access today. It's like you said, it's not going in and just accessing books. And so we've taken our technology resource center up there as well. So it's the, also the stop for students to go and maybe that laptop isn't working the way it's supposed to, or there's some software that they need that they don't have currently. So it's a great resource for our faculty, staff, and students in there as well. So. I think that's part of why the library is used so much. It's, it's, it's a hub yeah. now, and, and that's what you want. You, you want your areas on campus where a variety of people are, are comfortable being there. So another area that you get to oversee um, is the honors program. Tell us a little bit about the honors program and how it's unique here at SMSU. I was just visiting with um, Brett Gall, who's our honors program director, about this, and and he had a, a great way of explaining what what was unique about our honors program and how. Um, and I'll I'll never be able to do it justice with with the way he described it. But basically, you take your high achieving students. Um, they want an enhanced environment to study. They're okay with being challenged above and beyond what what uh, many of our you know really solid students in, in the majors were but maybe more on on the breadth of their knowledge as opposed to just in their major and the honors program gives that enhanced experience for um, students that are curious about just about learning in general as well as um, maybe students that uh, really want to enhance their critical thinking. And if you look at the students that have graduated out of our honors program recently, a lot of them are in graduate school. Um, we've got students in uh, 
different uh, um, professional programs. We've even got a student that was an honors graduate that's in med school right now. So um, it, it's, it's a high quality program. It's small, but it, it's about, you know, it's about the proportion yeah. that you would expect at an institution yeah. our size. So obviously COVID is, you can't have a conversation without talking about it one way, shape or form. But you've seen some changes over the last year, year and a half, um, with the way we've adapted it on campus with various things with COVID. What are some positives that have come out that have really changed maybe the way areas in your college have done some things and um, maybe done it for the better, and now we're going to continue to do it as we go back to a new normal? Yeah, it's a, you could look at, at COVID as being this oppressive uh, event, but I think as a campus, we saw it as an opportunity to innovate. Um, we had started, you know, some things like uh, with our online degrees, um, even before COVID, like uh, our history program was one of the ones that, that offered their courses online but also on campus simultaneously and students could come in online at the same time as the on-campus students or they could use the recorded versions of those lectures if they couldn't access it online. Well, we were brand new to that three years ago. We didn't really know how to do that. And when COVID hit and everyone was like, go home for a week, oh wait, no, two weeks, wait, no, three weeks, we had to reboot, and now we, we've got some skills, and, and we can, it, it, that doesn't seem like a big stretch for us anymore. It's like, oh yeah, we, we can offer that online section at the same time, and, and uh, not at the same time, and it, it's not really that big of a deal. And, and our faculty adapted, and, and now we've got 16 different online majors on campus, and I, and I don't think that would have grown to that without that, with, Without that, like COVID was an accelerant yeah. to that to that change and to the growth that we have. You didn't really have an option, and it pushed the envelope a little bit. Well, no, we, you know, we had an option of failing, and we chose not, not to. to yeah. and, and I think that's one of the reasons you look at our enrollment right now. We're the, we're the university in the system that that didn't lose students during COVID, and I think that's because. We knew that we didn't want to fail. We wanted to make sure that our students were successful and that we provided the supportive environment that is what SMSU is. Even if it was a pandemic, we found a way to reach those students. Yeah. And I was actually one of my next questions is, you know, we've been fortunate the last two years to have enrollment growth. Um, online is uh, certainly one example. Anything else in your uh, college that you can appoint, you can you know point to and say, yeah, that's one of the things that I think really has contributed to the growth that we've had in enrollment. I think if you look at the pivot that we had during COVID, um, we, we had a lot of conversations and a lot of action around how do we provide support to our students, and, and that was campus wide. I don't think that was my my college necessarily, but I think you also look at what our Center for International Education, and, and that's not my, uh, under my college at all, but, but thankfully the work the Center for International Education is doing in bringing international students to campus is benefiting my, my college uh, substantially. I look at my computer science program, my biology program, um, they're, they're getting a lot of international student growth. And so I think that, that part of it is, it, it's the campus effort and it's not, it's certainly not something that one program or an individual department is doing. So SMSU has been recognized on a number of fronts, um, you know, for really implementing and engaging in high impact practices. One of the most recent ones was we were named a College of Distinction. Share with us a little bit, you know, your knowledge of high impact practices and um, why they're so important here on this campus. Well, they're, and they're, they're not just on this campus, but for college students anywhere in, in the, across the country, they're important. Yeah, so um, high impact practices is basically nerdy college speak for something that helps students be more successful than if they wouldn't have had that experience. And so we do a few really good things on our campus. One is we're highly invested in civic engagement. You look at um, the, the Mustangs Give Day that we had this fall. Um, you look at the service learning programs that 
uh, that are happening in psychology and uh, exercise science with the, the um, employee wellness program and then pr programming that they offer. Um, so that civic engagement piece is considered a high impact practice. Global studies, which we're trying to get going as soon as we can get international travel again. We've got several global studies programs, biology is trying to get a, a trip uh, down to the Bahamas to do a research experience. Um, our uh, forensics program out of the communication program is trying to participate in an inter international speech tournament. Um, I know that our music program's trying to uh, get some uh, of our students to participate in, in some international travel there. Um, that global studies piece is considered a high impact practice, um, but probably the one that we do a little bit better than almost all of our peer institutions is undergraduate research. And if you look at our um, undergraduate research conference, I don't know when this is gonna air, but it's gonna air right around the time that we have our undergraduate research conference on campus. There will be um, several hundred students presenting um, upwards of a hundred or more uh, research projects that they did. And you know that's normally something in the United States that's reserved for graduate studies. And what we found is that if you get students involved in, in research and they learn where knowledge comes from, and how that process isn't perfect, then they can have a better perspective of what's in their textbooks or what's in, in the course materials that they have. And it, it really helps them understand um, why it's important to question things, but also be an expert in things. And, and it's really helped launch a lot of our students into their careers as well as into graduate programs. Very good, and, and there are a number of others, but I think those are three that you talked about that I think we do well, and obviously one that's got the most potential for us, and that's that global studies once we can start traveling on a global basis again. Right. But, so what, what are some new things on the horizon for the College of Arts, Letters, and Sciences? Oh, wow. Um, I probably should have studied up for the question like this. Um, I just heard that our creative writing program will be offering their program online as a major next year. Um, we mentioned the cybersecurity master's degree, so that'll be fully going next fall. Um, I know our, um, our data science program is working on uh, writing a million dollar grant right now through the Department of Education to try to get uh, some of their introductory courses offered in the schools the, through our College Now program, as well as enhancing some of their, their on-campus pathway to success. And, and maybe th they're, they're working on it, but uh, we're looking at how they uh, get their students set up in internships, also another high impact yeah. practice. Yeah. Um, yeah I, the undergraduate research conference coming up uh, is a big one. Uh, you got any that you want to remind me of? You, you're kind of. I, I think online programs is a big one. I think we're we're looking at some, uh, you know, some potential partnerships on online programs that we're just going to see nothing but growth there. So. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if we had a hundred or more new uh, students in our online majors next year. Yeah, it's a fun area to see grow. So. Well, Jeff, I have one last question for you, and this is always a tough one to put you on the spot. If you could tell a prospective student and their parents why SMSU was the place for them, what would it be? Yeah, um, which camera is it? Does it matter? Uh, so we really care deeply about your success. Uh, all of our faculty, all of our support faculty, our staff, our administration, we're gonna work hard to make sure that you're successful while you're here. Um, we've got great programs of study. Uh, we've got uh, great support services through uh, our Deanne Griebel Student Success Center. Uh, we've got uh, amazing people in our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Academic Opportunity and Success. So whether you're a first generation student, whether you are uh, new to this country, uh, if you uh, are needing some extra supports or whether you are good to go and you're ready to take off and take on a challenge like our honors program while you're getting your degree, 
we've, we've got the support to get you to the next thing in your life, whether that's career preparation, grad school, uh, different area of study, and, and we're gonna support you through that. Uh, and, and come here curious, come here ready to learn and ask questions, and don't be afraid to go in and knock on doors and ask for help, and, and we're gonna get you to the next thing in your life. So um, we're ready for you to come to SMSU, and uh, I wanna see you next fall. That's great, thank you, Jeff. A reminder that you can check out a full listing of the activities on campus on our website at SMSU Today, and be sure to follow us on our social media channels at SMSU Today. Once again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm Bill Molso, our host. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Jeff Bell from the Dean of the College of Arts, Letters, and Sciences. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.